Good morning. Welcome to Christ Fellowship Eastside. I don't know if you, uh, some of you regulars may notice that something feels different this morning. Uh, your, your normal seats may have shifted a little bit. Um, thanks to uh, Brent and Nick and Caleb came out to help us rearrange our space a little bit to hopefully pass uh, the fire inspection this time. Uh, because uh, I don't know if we need to do the airplane like exits this way and that way. Anyway, so, so if, if there is a fire, now you can get out. Um, that's a good thing. Um, glad y'all are here to worship Jesus uh, together with us this morning. Um, and if you're new with us and you didn't get uh, harassed on the way in, we have some cards we'd love for you to fill out in the back. And we have a, a little gift bag for you as well. Um, and, and of course, throughout this series, we have a book that we're giving away, um, that we have a whole mound of those in the back. So please grab those, as this is the last week of this series. We'll probably still leave some out, but please take a ton with you as you go. Um, as, as you're getting started in, in, in orienting our hearts around worship, especially around a relatively challenging topic this morning, I was thinking about a, a verse to tee this up for us. Uh, it comes from Romans chapter 13. Verse 12, it says, the night is far gone, the day is at hand, so then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Um, this this is an encouragement for us to find the power and the hope uh, to, to deal with the, the challenges and, the, and the, the lusts and the, the sinful desires that attack us through the power of Jesus. He is the one that gives us the armor to withstand and to stand strong in the face of, of challenge and temptation, and, and we can find hope. And, and just as a, the, the history nerd throw, throwaway reference here, this is the passage that encouraged Augustine when he was um, at, at his lowest point and struggling uh, with sexual sin and trying to figure out if there was hope for him uh, for, for even, even being able to pursue a life of righteousness in Christ. And he saw in this passage a glimmer of hope that, that he wouldn't be left alone, that Jesus would give him all that was needed for life and godliness. And may that give us hope this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that we are not left alone to fight with sin on our own strength, in our own, with our own weapons and with our own armor, but that you have given us your armor, that you have given us Jesus, and may we rejoice in what he's done for us. May he be our hope in life and in death. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd invite you to stand together, church, as we sing Christ our hope in life and death. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong? Who holds our days within His hand? What comes apart from this man? And what will be? So we sing. Oh, sing. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the storm. 
sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope. Christ is our only source of hope, our only source of help this morning. We run to Him. We worship Him. We'll sing of Him for all eternity. Unto the grave, what will we sing? Christ, He lives. Christ, He lives. And what reward will ever bring? Everlasting life, amen. There we will rise to meet the Lord, and sin and death will be destroyed, and we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Thankful for hope in Christ this morning. Yeah, would you give him praise this morning, church? Continue to sing of our hope in the gospel. The Lord is our salvation. We'll sing of the grace of God. The grace of God is reached for me. from the raging sea and I am safe on the solid ground the Lord is my salvation Amen. I will not fear when darkness falls as His strength will help us I will not fear when darkness falls. His strength will help me still these walls. I'll see the dawn of the rising sun. The Lord is my Yeah. 
my hope is hidden in the Lord. He flowers each promise of His word. He's always the same. When winter fades, I know spring will come. The Lord is my salvation. to the Father, to the Son, to the Spirit. Glory be to God, the Father. Glory be to God, the Son. Glory be to God, the Spirit. moment thank God for salvation forgiveness of sins passage of scripture this morning as we sing a song we've sang the last few weeks, one we've learned together, Hymn of Heaven. Hope those words have been meaningful, significant to you in your life, and whatever you find yourself facing. We'll sing it one more time uh, here at the end of the month. I want to remind you of 1 Corinthians 13 where it says, love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for languages, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see indistinctly, as in a mirror, but then face to face, now I know in part. Then I will know fully, as I am fully known. This song talks about our heart's desire, our longing for the day that we will breathe the air of heaven, longing for the day when pain, when sin, and death will be no more. And yet now we see the glory of God, right? We see God working in creation, both over it and in it. And yet there is a day coming when we will see fully his face, when we see face to face the one who died and rose again. And we'll sing together, holy, holy is the Lord. And so as we see now in a mirror, we wait 
for the full reality that we will see uh, the face of our Savior one day. And that means that even now, even whatever we're facing, whatever we're experiencing, we can shout and sing together the hymn of heaven. We'll sing together this song as we continue to worship. How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets And look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for all eternity There will be a day when all will bow before Him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face, if you died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. And every prayer in desperation the songs of faith sing to doubt and fear and in the end we we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears there will Join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice, a thousand generations sing worthy. holy would you say amen amen god we love you we praise you we lift you up because you're worthy of our praise lord we don't sing these songs for any emotion we don't sing these songs for any feeling we don't sing them out of any obligation only that you are worthy to receive them so we lift them up as praise to you this morning we thank you we love you and it's in your name we pray amen thank you church you can be seated well good morning church it's good to be up here this morning. I'm Pastor Chastain, one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship Eastside, and I'm excited about the opportunity to speak with you this morning, um, albeit a difficult topic, no doubt. I will, I will thank Phil for that. Appreciate you, Phil. Um, but we are going to close out our topical series this morning, and um, 
You can go ahead and hold your place. I'm going to get to John chapter 4 at some point here, um, but want to do a, a little bit of setup. Um, so I'm um, excited, and um, if you've been with us at all the last several weeks, or really just this month, um, we've, we've hit a variety of hot-button topics. Um, as you see on the screen beside, on either side of me, there's several things. What did um, Jesus say anything, did he say anything about gender, racism? Did he say anything about abortion? And this morning as we close out, we're going to talk about a topic that has been around for forever. And um, the issue of sex, more specifically, does Jesus say anything about who I sleep with? So now we know as a culture, uh, we've de- the, there's been some questions, maybe some answers developed for this. Likewise, within the church, we have developed some answers to this question. But again, as, as Christians, we ultimately be- are beholden to to Jesus and what he had to say about the question, the issue. And so that's what we want to consider this morning, what I want to help us think through and to understand and, and to put into practice. And so um, I'm going to hit a few, just skip a stone here, as Pastor Phil's done the last several weeks. But um, uh, we're not here to be political. It's not what we're for, we're, but we do want to be practical. Um, we recognize it's an important issue, um, specifically for parents Um, trying to navigate this with their kids, and undoubtedly we have members that have been up close and personal with folks that have uh, walked this path, asked these questions, maybe experienced pain in this area, uh, or perhaps have been impacted themselves. And so we certainly want to be practical about offering some help. Secondly, we're not going to be overly graphic um, about these topics. You're welcome this morning ahead of time. But we're not going to go there, uh, but we do want to be precise. And so I will want to make the disclaimer that there are, this is certainly a touchy subject. And so if you have kids this morning, we have additional child care up to the age of 12 if you're not prepared for them to talk through or listen about the subject. Thirdly, we're not saying anything new on the subject. So um, I'm not going to likely blow you away, right? But I am hopefully going to help you think through the topic. I'm not saying anything new. There have been others that have done it much better than I have done. But we, are wanna, we do want to do it in such a way that it's not political, that it is practical, and it's theologically sound. It's tied to what the Bible says about it. And so first and foremost, I want to offer to you, um, Phil gave this to me as we were preparing for the series, but Sam Alberry's uh, Why Does God Care Who I Sleep With? Good resource. Really helped me in the development of this sermon. Um, secondly, um, He's already mentioned uh, one, um, but Augustine's um, confessions. So how does he go from this life of sexual immorality? How does he develop a relationship with the Lord? And then C.S. Lewis's mere Christianity. So um, C.S. Lewis is way smarter than me. Both of them, likely, way smarter than me. But I do think there's several topics, several chapters in there that C.S. Lewis will tackle as well. And I will will quote him this morning. So I want to kind of give you those references and resources. And then, fourthly, you know, we're, we're likely, I'm not going to be able to cover every facet, every angle of this topic. I certainly just don't have time. I mean, there's a lot to it. There's a, lo- a lot of different ways you can go, a lot of threads you can pull on. But I'll do my best to respond um, to what these questions of today are, and even to offer th- after service, um, I know Phil and I will be down front if there are some questions that you have, maybe there's something that I say this morning or something you're like, wait a minute, what about? Um, we certainly want to invite that and have the dialogue, have the discussion. So without further delay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, di- we're going to dive in. Does God say anything about, did Jesus say anything about who I sleep with? So look around culture, and as you navigate daily life, it's nearly impossible, nearly impossible to avoid the subject. Everything from commercials to ads, all of them are most likely enhanced in some way, some fashion with sexual images, innuendo. It's everywhere. And if you try to count the number, oh my goodness, if you try to count the number of commercials for erectile dysfunction, you'll lose count. It is ridiculous, right? You cannot go anywhere without it popping up. Or how about dating apps? I don't know which way you're supposed to swipe. No idea. But I know that But that's it's, we're bombarded with it. And then likely, in most ways, it's the sexual images, the, the push toward that. Because in culture, society, that's what matters. It really doesn't matter what you're watching. In many cases, you can be online just reading a news story, and you're going to see something pop up. 
if you're not careful, right? It's going to pop up. Not that you directly went to a site, but it's there to pull you in. Be careful. We're bombarded by it. If you can't buy into the idea, right, sex sells, the advertising mantra, it's real and it's pervasive. That's everywhere we look. So beyond the everyday bombardment of the advertising world, you don't have to look very far to also see. You can watch, turn on the news, anything. There's a connection to our schools, to entertainment, to dining, politics, social circles. It's everywhere. This issue of sex, this sexuality idea of who I sleep with shares a very close link to why there's so much emphasis. I'll be honest. I think this this is the tying link to gender identity to abortion, to racism, all of our topics, I feel like this one kind of pulls it together. And I'm hoping to explore that a little bit with you this morning about how. Um, how it's all pulling together. Because if you think about it, what we think and believe about sex dictates who we are, what we do, more than you might think. It impacts our views of sexuality, um, sex in general, the relationships we form. is not an inconsequential matter. It's, it matters. So today's topic, it garners, I suspect, a lot of inner emotions, thoughts, maybe good and bad memories, perhaps even painful ones for some of us, that have shaped who we are and who we're becoming. Go back a little bit of ways, from everywhere from the sexual revolution to the make love, not war, to the, hey, the Me Too movement, um, even the sexual misconduct of some of our Christian institutions. It's all tied to these things. This issue matters, and it matters to all of us. And I want to consider the topic through three viewpoints this morning that we've done every week so far. And we're going to talk from the progressive viewpoint, the traditional viewpoint, and from the biblical. What does Jesus have to say about it viewpoint? So I'm going to start from the beginning. So here's the thing. What's, this is interesting to me. You can talk particularly the sexual or the gender identity crowd or maybe just the, the LGBTQTIA+. Plus. I, I don't know if I got them all. But they're all there. And now, if you were to have a conversation, have, so, you know, your biblical view, that's traditional. That's kind of old school, right? So you can't talk to me. You can't convince me from, from Romans, man. You can't go to Leviticus and Romans on me. Okay. How about we go to Genesis? How about we start at the beginning? I don't have to go to Romans. I don't have to go to, I don't have to, go to those other places. Let's go, to the, let's go to the beginning. So we know the first verse of the Bible, in the beginning God, right? He created. So what does he create? He creates everything. Everything. And then he notices there's something missed. So he, he said, hey, verse 26, ch- chapter 1 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. There's our baseline. I didn't say that. God did. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, every creature that crawls on the earth. Gets a little more detailed in chapter 2. Flip over to chapter 2, verse 21. The Lord caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Verse 22. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. Some ill Some uh, versions of the Bible say he presented her to the man. That's important. Verse 23, the reaction of the man. The man said, this one, at last, it's bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. Verse 24, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. So from the beginning, baseline, God created male Male and female, man and woman, he instituted marriage. He presents the woman to the man, brings her to him, and they're together. God institutes marriage. He he defines and assigns gender. He institutes marriage and sexuality and originates it at the beginning, from the very beginning. Sex and the parameters for that sexuality are God's idea. Again, this isn't me. This is God's word. It's his idea, and as the creator and originator of the concept, the subject, and the issue, he's the expert on it. So, what does God tell us in those first two chapters, what sex is about and what it's for? Does he care who we sleep with? Yes, man, woman, institute of marriage, 
covenantly together to be fruitful, to multiply and fill the earth for procreation, to fill the earth. If human life is so sacred to God, if he wants to create and he wants to make and he wants things to be filled, he gives us this simple job of doing, right? To create, to fill, to multiply. If that is sacred to him, and we, have, we established last week with, a, with abortion that life is sacred to him, we're all created in his image to reflect his glory, it's, it matters, then don't you think the act of creating that life is pretty sacred? It's pretty important to him. And so he, he's created this. He's given us the parameters. It's for, it is to come together, to become one flesh, to multiply, to be fruitful. Secondly, that oneness, that unity, the two become one. This flesh, this one flesh union of man and woman in the context of marriage, this again, it's this sacred act signifying the unity, the coming together to become one. Emotionally, physically, psychologically. It's that idea of with all my heart, soul, mind, and body. Does that sound familiar? It's a picture of that, right? I'm going to love the Lord my God with all I am. It's the picture of this marriage coming together of God's ultimate love through the giving of Jesus. It's to reflect that. And so it's this union, this powerful force that's more than just a sense of or a means of getting pleasure. It's more than that. And it's also, God established, it's self-giving, not self-serving. Now, you look around, and we're going to start getting into the other oh, culture, how the culture defines it. That's going to be really critical right there. It's not self-serving. It's self-giving. Tim Keller describes it as sex as God's appointed way for two people. To reciprocally say to one another, I belong completely, permanently, and exclusively to you. We must not use sex to say anything else. That's important. We must not use sex to say anything else. So Jesus confirms this. So this, I went to Genesis. Now we'll go New Testament. How does Jesus, what does he really feel about this? Pastor Phil hit on this a couple weeks ago with Matthew 19. But he gets questioned by these folks about divorce. And you got to understand at this time, men were the only one to be able to, in, to institute that, to move forward, to initiate divorce. So they come to him and they ask this question about divorce. And Jesus replies, Matthew 19, verse 4, haven't you read? One of my favorite. He's always, hey, guys, you experts of law, haven't y'all read? Don't you know what the Bible says? Haven't you read, he replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female. Now, why did he go there? Simple question about divorce. He's establishing the baseline of what the, the emphasis, the, the origination was for. Male and female, marriage. He made them male and female. Verse 5, and he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Verse 6, often you'll hear this at weddings, right? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. It's this powerful force of bringing two together to make one that's not intended to be separated. Not intended to be. But here's the thing. Oftentimes, we look at Jesus as, well, he's coming to point the finger and to put us on the hook for things. I thought it was really well stated. Jesus didn't come to put us on the hook. He came to tell us we're already on it. He ups the ante. I mean, look how he ups the ante. And look at Matthew 5, verse 27. has also feel alluded to before chapter 5 verse 27 you've heard it said do not commit adultery but i tell you everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart this is significant he's up in the ante he's elevating the idea this standard beyond just a physical act it's highlighting the inner thoughts the intent first time we've gotten to that right it's the intent of the thought Ultimately, what's he getting at? It's a heart issue. And that's revolutionary for this time and for ours today. It's a heart issue. We've established before, back in the traditional time of the ancient times, you could divorce your wife for most anything. She burnt your food. You can divorce your wife. We in trouble, right? <laughs> but think about that. And, and the woman, couldn't, she couldn't initiate it. The man did. And so he's telling them, hey, guys, this is a bringing together. It's the intent. It's a heart issue. It's a revolutionary concept. 
So I wanted to give us a, a, a good, firm baseline on where we are, on how it was created, originated, how it was defined and established. Secondly, we're going to look at progressive culture's idea on these things. So um, feeling how we're talking about this, and uh, I, my mind immediately, like I like old songs, um, whether it's a good beat. I like a variety of genres of, of music. But I remember growing up in the 80s, and um, I know I've just dated myself. And, um, right, some of the best decades of music, just saying. But here I am, and I'm, a, I'm you know, I was born in 79, so go ahead and do the math. But so here I am as a young child, elementary school student, and one of the songs that captures my attention, ZZ Top, right? Sharp Dressed Man, right? I know. But you think about it, give me all your loving. And we were talking about the tagline, how this goes. It's, give me all your loving and all your, lo- your hugs and kisses, too. All that stuff, too. What are we driving at? Right? Where's our culture pushing us toward? Give me all your loving. Oh, and your hugs and kisses, too. This is what we are bombarded with. It's this push that this sexual freedom, this expression, this I can do what I want with who I want when I want. And you can't, you're not the boss of me. I can do what I want. And it's, hey, this is my right. It's fundamentally my right to express myself in this way. And for you to put a restriction on it, man, well, that's, a, that's an existential threat to me. You're, not, you're, you're restricting me. You can't restrict me. Now, I know if you, anyone in here has got kids, we don't like to be told what to do. Right? Just look at the kids. They won't be told what to do. And we don't like being told. We think we know best. And so if sex is about recreation, then it's, and it's a means of, and Sam Alberry puts it this way in his book, if it's a means of enjoyment with no unchosen reproductive consequences, then you can't tell me what to do. See how that ties together for the last couple of weeks? No unchosen reproductive consequences. I want to do what I want when I want with whoever I want. And I don't want to accept responsibility for it. I don't have to be accountable for it. So like hunger, it's satisfied by food, then my sexual appetite's got to be satisfied by sexual activity. And you can't tell me it's wrong. You can't tell me that. Well, there's a couple cracks in that. I'm going to hit on a few of those in a moment. But if that's the case, if my sexual expression is what makes me and who I am, isn't that a bit selfish? Didn't we just talk about the baseline that it's not a self-taking act, it's a self-giving thing? Doesn't it become a bit of a commodity that way? Doesn't it make it cheap? Doesn't it cheapen things a little bit? A little bit of a crack there where it doesn't mean as much, matter as much? How about these examples right here? You have the Me Too movement. How about the, the newest form of slavery in our society around the world, the sef- sex trafficking? Look at those numbers. That's astounding. $32 billion around the world, sex trafficking. And these are not your of age, typically, right? They're being forced into these situations, or they're being lured into them. In the, in the U.S. alone, it's 10, nearly $10 billion. You know the, one, the single event of the year that is the largest gathering for sex trafficking in the world is? And we're about to celebrate it in two weeks. It's the Super Bowl. Now, that, ought, that, might, that should astound you a bit. That is the greatest concentration of sex trafficking in the world. It's crazy. So if I can do what I want with who I want whenever I want, we got some cracks in that foundation. Or how about it's my life, it's now or never, I, don't wanna, I, I ain't going to live forever. Well, Bon Jovi there for some of you. It's my life. Or how about I was born this way. I'm on the right track, baby. Little Lady Gaga. I got some hip. I got a little bit. Right? Thank you, Phil. Appreciate that. But look, think about the mantra there. It's my life. Or I'm on the right track. I was born this way. Okay. Self-fulfillment then. My path. My life. What I think about or do in my private on my own, it don't bother anybody else. It's just me. 
This, sex, this sexual individuality becomes my primary form of self-expression, and I'm alone. Yeah, I'm bothering nobody. Well, can I submit the fact that distorted views on that idea, the pornography industry, the sex trafficking industry as a whole, the exploitation, the, the dehumanization of these folks, they don't hold, we devalue them. They're just a picture on a screen. They're not real people. See how that can breed? We're not created. If we're creating God's image to reflect his glory, do you see the difficulty there of how that dehumanizes and devalues people? It, it creates this idea that I can only be fulfilled because of if I get to express who I am as my sexual identity. That's heavy. That's a lot of pressure. But this is what we create. It's to restrict. You know, if you're trying to restrict me, then you're keeping me from being who I am. Okay? How about these examples? You're keeping me from who I am, right? This is who I am. I identify this way. Well, be careful. How about someone? It hasn't happened yet, but it's coming. Mark my words. Well, I identify as a 14-year-old boy. We, I can hang out with these kids and do whatever I want, right? And that happened. But if we, if we can identify who we want and be what we want, who's to say that that's wrong? Now, currently, right now, that's wrong, and it should be. But you know, in the time, we like to think, well, that was, you know, Jesus' idea, God's idea was way back. That's old school. Ancient civilization, first century. That wasn't wrong in the Roman world. Man with man, man with kids. That wasn't, a, that wasn't frowned upon. The church made that an issue. The Bible makes that an issue. Be careful. There's cracks in that foundation. Or how about our traditional view? How has the church tended to handle this issue? Well, sex is rightly between a man and a woman with the, within the covenant of marriage. It's... It's an issue. It's, it's a good one. And then we, and I don't mean to say this in a bad way. I, I'm, I want to state this verse in such a way that it's the way it's used oftentimes. But we would say, well, it's better to marry than burn with passion. But the timing matters. We look at 1 Corinthians 7. Paul says, I say, verse 8, I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it's good for them if they remain as I am. But if they do not have self-control, they should marry, since it's better to marry than to burn with desire. Church, the church rightly saying, hey, if you can't practice self-control, we, we want to create that avenue for you to practice self-control. We need to encourage you to go away from those things. But sex within marriage is the only honorable thing, okay? Because those sexual feelings are powerful. And they are. And they are. They're non-reversible. You genuinely think you can go down that path and feel like I'm one and done? It's, it's too powerful for that. And so the church rightly is trying to say, hey, no, slow, low, let's put some brakes on that. Slow roll it. Don't go down that path. No, 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 because it's bad. And, it's, and that's, those are all good things. But we create these, we add these gates. It's not unlike the, the law and the Jews trying to, set parameters because they didn't want to create and they didn't want it to be a sin issue and step into a and break a direct law you know the ten commandments so they start creating these fences they put fence around it well how far can i go right that's what comes out of it we we want to push people to say hey don't do it don't do it. it's bad it's bad it's bad or we say hey practice practice abstinence remain or remain celibate don't don't even go there Maybe it's a life of celibacy for you. Create those additional gates. We, we, we lay down some rules to restrict those opportunities, and I, the intent is good. Hear me. The intent is good. But what is dis the distortion of it? If you grew up in the 80s and 90s like I did, this true love waits. Anyone familiar with true love waits at all? Right? If, true, if they really love one another, then they'll wait till they get married. Right? But we just talked about that. Man, instead of burning with passion, let's just get married. We can't handle it. Let's just get married. Because this whole thing is dirty. It's shameful anyways. We should just get married. Because that's, that's a good idea. Right? 
I mean, I can't practice self-control, and we're at each other, so we should just get married. And then it's okay. So if you're getting married to have sex, that's a bad idea. Just, just a freebie right there. But that's what we've created. Two wrongs aren't making a right. I mean, think about that for a moment. I know there's a variety of factors that go into every marriage. But I kind of tend to believe to think that some of the divorce rates in the church might have something to do. We're going to, oh, we made a mistake. We're pregnant. We got to, I got to make, got to make an honorable woman out of her, right? Got to get married. Got to make it right. Are we making it right? You see the distortion there? Be careful. And then, or we try to, hey, we've set these laws up. We've set these gates. Hey, you shouldn't do this thing. It's bad. It's dirty. It's, hey, you don't want to be, you don't want to shame yourself. You don't want to get this, an STD. You don't want to get pregnant. You don't want to do these things, right? But then what happens is, man, failure is final. It's certainly unforgivable. That's where we live. That's how it feels. I don't know about all of you, but I know growing up in high school, reading Nathaniel Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter, scandalous, right? Here's this woman. She's got to wear an A for adultery because she's got a child out of a wedlock. And the scandalous fact is it's the priest. <laughs> he doesn't own it. And she's the one that lives in shame over it and has to endure and yet here we are, it's unforgivable. So what is, how does everyone treat her? Not too good. No one goes out there with an open hand to receive her in and show grace and mercy. Right? There's the story. It's, it's unforgivable. Oh, man, you did that. As opposed to, oh, man, you got a gambling problem. Man, you should get some help for that. I'm coming alongside you to help you with that. But not, not sexual immorality, right? Not sexual sins. Now you're just, you're just beyond help. Now, we don't say that, but in many ways, that's how we act within the church. A little bit of a crack in the foundation. Again, that's above and beyond the biblical baseline that we've established. Now, flip over to John chapter 4 with me. I told you we'd get there. And I'm going to try to skip a stone because I know it's, I got 30 verses and I'm not going to run it through. I know we, I'm going to do my 40-ish that Phil tells everyone every week. But I am going to pick up a few places that we're going to say. So, so Jesus is traveling. He's, he goes through Samaria. Most folks avoid that area. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. The woman at the well. Jesus comes to Jacob's well that was there. Verse 7 says, A woman of Samaria, Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? Verse 12 says, You aren't greater than, or she says, You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said, Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never thirst or never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Verse 15, Sir, the woman said to him, Give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Verse 16, Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. Verse 17, I don't have a husband, she answered. You've correctly said, I don't have a husband, Jesus said, for... You've had five husbands, and the man that you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. Verse 19, Sir, the woman replied, I see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Pretty significant things here. 
Picture it with me. Some 2,000 years ago, Jesus meets this woman at the well. Here's what we see. She's physically alone. She's by herself, drawing water during, at the hottest part of the day when no one else is drawing water because they know it's too hot. They're going to go early or they'll go late, but they're not going to go middle of the day. She's got no social life, no companionship. She's by herself at the well. And what do we find out? She's got a complicated sexual history, right? It's complicated. Her love life appears to be a series of failed attempts to satisfy her desires, to find fulfillment, to understand who her identity is. She's a mess with little to no hope of true fulfillment prior to this encounter with Jesus. So, three viewpoints. Traditional viewpoint on this idea. Clearly, her sexual history is, her, uh, her reputation is preceded her, right? No one's going to help her. No one's going to even hang, hang out with her. She doesn't go during the mornings when everybody else does to commune with others and socialize. She's an outcast. She's isolated and pushed aside. She's ostracized. Why? She's got a sexual history that is not kosher with what it's supposed to be. And that's a problem. She doesn't mix with others. Clearly, they know who she is and the scandalous nature of her life and past. She's viewed as this outcast due to her, moral, her immoral life and history. And they would claim she's been dishonored. The only honorable thing is the sex within marriage. And you've, I mean, you've been cast aside or you've been married five times. The one you're with now is not even your husband. In many ways, we've already told her as a traditional society, there's no hope for you. I mean, you're on your own. You've messed up. Sorry. Failure's final. You've got to live a life of shame now. Now, we don't say that, right? We're better than that. But by not saying it, by not extending any kind of grace, we are saying it, right? Traditional viewpoint. How about the progressive viewpoint? You know, she's free to express herself any way she wants to. She can do what she wants with who she wants whenever she wants. Not a big deal. So she's, she's been married five times. So what? I mean, the guy she's living with now, nah, not a big deal. It's fine. It's just trying to figure out who she is. She's doing what she wants to find out what she really wants and who she really is to fulfill herself. It's this idea, you know, the, the old Jerry Maguire, you complete me. It's what she's after. You complete me. To be authentically who she is or who she identifies to be, she's got to lead this sexually and remote, romantically fulfilled life. So she's within this culture. She's accepted it. The church, the traditional folks have pushed me away. But the progressive world is okay with it. It's not a big deal. So we don't look in and look up. We look in and then we look around. Who's like me? Who's like me? Who's been hurt, mistreated? Oh, well, they have. I'll go commune with them. And it's okay. My life's okay. So we see this. She's trying to satisfy her, her desires of fulfillment and completeness by seeking satisfaction in, in this sexual fulfillment, to quench that thirst. It's, 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 it's the idea of you know, shipwrecked sailor in a little lifeboat, haven't had anything in weeks, and you just start drinking salt water. Does that quench your thirst? No. It, may, it drives you mad to have more, and ultimately you'll die of it. So you have this taste, this feeling. It's a, remember, we said it's a very powerful thing, these feelings, this oneness that God intended. And it drives us to seek it. And we got to be careful. Timing does matter. Song of Songs tells us don't awaken that passion and those feelings too soon because you can't, can't put it back in. Once it's out of the toothpaste container, you ain't putting it back in, right? So it's this expression that comes out. And so she's... She's tasted it, and it's good, and she wants more of it, and I'm just going to keep pursuing it. But just keep in mind, there's another alternative. There's another idea to this. She's been repeatedly, I would suggest, she's been repeatedly cast aside. She's been dehumanized and broken down and pushed away. Because what did we say a minute ago that I've hit on twice already? She, could, she didn't initiate the divorce from those five 
previous men. They did. Because she's been chewed up and spit out. Because they didn't, she didn't fulfill them. You see the brokenness and the cycle? And that's what she's called in. She's just in the cycle now. I don't have any hope to get out of it. The church isn't extending a hand. The world doesn't extend a hand. I'm just caught in this thing, and this is the way it's supposed to be. I've got no other hope. This is what I got. I got to find the next or the next or the next. So she's been used and exploited. Every relationship she's had has been broken and unfulfilling, and she's been pushed out. So not only has the church not realized that, I mean, where are the men? It's like the lady that they bring to Jesus that's been caught in the act. They don't bring the man. They bring her. And again, we're going to see how Jesus interprets that. He's like, hey, don't sin anymore. Where are your condemners after he starts? We don't know what he did. We can, we can speculate, writing in the, the dirt, whatever. Maybe he's doing some kind of sin writing. I've heard that preached that way. I don't, I don't know. But what I do know is they've, they've pushed her aside. Society, the church... How does Jesus tackle this? We know the baseline, but how does he tackle it? Well, Jesus sees her. He doesn't avoid her. He doesn't push her away. He initiates conversation with her. Now, this is crazy on multiple levels because I told you, I think this one ties it all together because she's a Samaritan. She's looked down upon by the Jews, so there's some racism in there. Socially, he's a man talking to a woman alone. That, that's not great. It's not a good position to be in, particularly this woman, right? She's been married five times, sleeping with another man. Morally, religiously, the gender barriers of the day, he cuts across that. He doesn't shun her. He doesn't ignore her. He doesn't even look down on her. You notice that? He initiates this conversation, and he goes down the path of addressing her sin. He does bring it up. Don't get me wrong. He doesn't ignore it. You're right. You don't have a husband, and the, you've had five, and the one you're with now is not your husband. So he, he identifies the problem and addresses it. And she very quickly, well, you know, you Jews say, I, 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 you must be a prophet. And so, but what does he do? He redirects and brings her back around. He recognizes two of her, great, her two greatest needs. She needs to be known and loved. We all do. And she needs a new heart. She needs a new heart. And and what's really crazy about this whole thing, if you start going through our, you know, when we went through Luke and you start going through the gospel different times and, you know, he's always telling his disciples to wait. You know, who do the people say I am? And he never really says who he is, right? He's very cautious as to what he lets on on who he is. But he's very upfront with her. He tells her, I'm I, the one you speak of, and he, I am the Messiah. And I'm offering you this living water. I'm offering you the gospel. I'm offering to give you a a new heart, a true identity in Christ. I'm offering you the the fulfillment of being known and loved. That's what he offers her. So maybe, I mean, let's let's trans you know move forward a little bit. So these are that this is the way the few the viewpoints hit it, but maybe you find yourself or have found yourself in a similar position on either side of those. Stuck in the progressive or traditional viewpoint. And I suspect we've all, in some point in our life, been in one ditch or the other. Oh, it's fine, or oh my gosh, I can't believe, right? One ditch or the other. And it's really easy, I mean, to, to think one, this way's got it all together, that way's got it all together. But I would say, as in many ways, the church has lost ground here. We don't like talking about it. It's taboo. And I will tell you, I mean, between me and Phil, we got seven daughters. Right? If we ain't talking about it, someone's going to talk about it. Someone's going to tell them. You realize that the statistics will tell us that 95% of men have viewed pornography? And it's a lie, unless you're just not counting babies. It's 100. But do you realize the fastest growing viewer of pornography is young ladies? Why? Are they, statistics will say, because they're trying to see what will satisfy the man or what, what they need to do. Right? If we ain't going to talk about it as the church, we're losing ground. 
we've lost ground. Not only that, the, our stance on it beforehand, I mean, the traditional viewpoint has pushed it aside even further. We're stiff-arming those that have messed up, and we've lost ground. Just like we did on abortion, and what we've done, what we've done we're in danger of doing on racism and gender. We've, we've stiff-armed it. We're losing ground. I've told Phil this story. I was listening to a, a sermon, and this young lady talked about, they were talking about true love weights growing up in that that mindset, and um, she said, you know, I went to college. I was a big proponent. I was making all, you know, I was really on this true love weights thing, and she said, but I found myself after some, a series of mistaken choices in a Planned Parenthood center. She said, no, I didn't go through with it. She said, but I'm here to tell you why I was there, because I didn't think I could go to the church. Really? For the broken, the wounded? And this is what we're supposed to be about. But she didn't feel comfortable going home or going to the church. Why? Because, man, she messed up. Of all the, sex, of all the sins, the sexual, and man, we, can't, we just can't get over that one. And so this is where we go. We push away, and then the, the world's over going, come on over here. We, you're free to do however you want to. We're okay with that. We'll accept everybody because, you know what, it's just a form of self-expression. And we're losing ground. We've lost ground. So we got to be careful not to make sexual freedom or sexual purity our ultimate good. That's a bit short-sighted. Those are not bad things, I understand, but it's it's short-sighted. It's bigger than that. What if we realized instead that our sexuality was meant to tell a bigger story? It was established and originated to reflect a bigger and better story. To demonstrate the story of God's ultimate love shown to us in Jesus. That's the bigger story. And it's a better story. And it's one that I can get on board with, right? I mean, it's not hard. It's a reflection of who God is and what he's done. And what he's asked us to do. But instead, oftentimes, we are, I think C.S. Lewis expresses this pretty well in Mere Christianity. I think we're half-hearted creatures, Fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. We're just just far too easily pleased. Rather than looking at it and holding it up as this sacred or this enjoyable thing, yes, but it's sac- this sacred thing, this institution of, of man and woman together, this sexual union, this powerful force that reflects and points us up to God and his love for us in Jesus, rather than that, we're far too easily pleased. We would much rather go and just have this cheap encounter here, cheap encounter there. It's, it's easier, right? It's easier. So here's I want to offer to those. I mean, what if, what if I've blown it already? What if I've been torn by this idea? What if I've bought into the progressive lie that I can be who I want, whenever I want, with who I want? Or what if I've been on the other side of that and I've stiff-armed someone and not extended grace? What if I've been that person whose life is a mess with no hope? What if that's who I am? Well, God knows that. And the good news is God loves you. Your failures, your missteps, your flaws are not final. Someone needs to hear that this morning. They're not final. The gospel is for you. And here's the good part of that. You haven't out the grace of God. You haven't out God's love. So I say all that to say and kind of land the plane a bit. Does Jesus say anything about who I sleep with? Clearly, he says a lot. He says a lot. So the the secondary question is, why does God care? Why does God even care who I sleep with? Because he cares deeply about all of us. And because sex and sexuality were are his idea. Not mine, not yours. They were his idea. And because, and this is, I thought this was really interesting that Sam Alberry puts it breaks it down like this. We, we think of sex too much and too little, uh, which kind of struck, struck me a bit. 
We think about it too much because we're tempted to find fulfillment and identity in our sexual intimacy. But we think about it too little because we fail to see that our greatest sexual yearnings and the unity it brings is pointing us to the perfect love of God that he has shown us in Christ. Too much and too little. Don't, don't lose ground. God cares who we sleep with because he knows the misuse of sex can cause deep hurt, pain, and damage. But guess what? He cares enough not to leave us alone in dealing with that hurt, pain, and damage. He makes forgiveness and healing available in Jesus, even when we mess up. I find this most often with my kids. They've wronged me. It upsets me, but I forgive them and I love them. I did the same thing to my parents. I blew it. I messed up, but they loved me. They could have very easily pushed me out, right? Don't push out. Don't lose the ground. Satan would like nothing better than, you, than for you when, you're, when someone messes up for you to push them out. He would like nothing better than that. Extend the grace. God cares who we sleep with because he wants us to know him and experience his love. We want to be known. That's our greatest need, right? We want to be known and we want to be loved. And there it is right there in the gospel. He wants to know us and have a relationship with us. And he wants us to be in him. God does that. Ultimately, I will tell you, the biblical view of sex is good. It's ultimately pointing us to the deepest experience of love imaginable. It points us to the idea of being known and being loved by God. So I would tell you in conclusion throughout this series how they're all tied together, but God says an awful lot about sex and sexuality. He does care who we sleep with because he cares an awful lot about you and me. He cares an awful lot about you and me. I know that we live in a time where people say, well, man, that's, that's so ancient. That's years ago. This was controversial in Jesus' time. Again, I've already established these things were not off limits. Kids were not off limits in the ancient world. But God has made a way for us to point us to him. And I want to encourage you to look to him. God loves us. God loves you. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your goodness, for your grace, your kindness to us. We thank you that you didn't leave us, you don't leave us in our sin, but you have made a way for us to have fellowship in you. And you've done that in Jesus. God, you sent him to die on the cross for our sins. You raised him up after three days to give us newness of life. And God, he's seated even now at, our, at the right hand of, of you to make intercession for us. Lord God, his grace is available to us. He's for us, he loves us. And he's not pushing us away. God, we thank you. We praise you for that. And I pray that we would extend your grace and mercy and your love to others, to one another, that we would reflect you to those around us. God, we love you. We're thankful that you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Chastain. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to be a part of a church that's willing to take four weeks uh, in a topical series like this and address difficult uh, conversations, to, to start those conversations. And that's really what it is, even as the series is closing this week, as we launch into a, an expositional series, kind of our bread and butter uh, of, of teaching through the year, um, a new series starting next week. Really, this, this closing of this topical series is really just the beginning of a conversation um, that we're wanting to have uh, with you as you live through life, as you address uh, different things in your personal lives and your family lives. These, these are the things that we want to be about, helping you navigate and understand from a biblical perspective uh, really what's taking place um, in our world. And as I thought about um, what we could close with this morning, really reflecting on all four of the sermons in this series, we always go out singing of the gospel, but I want to go out with an invitation, a song of invitation that says we can run to the Father and to fall into grace. So I invite you to stand together as we sing, I run to the Father. I've carried a burden too long on my own. 
I was his created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now, laying it down. Father, we find forgiveness. Would you give him praise for forgiveness this morning? Amen. Thank you, church. You can be seated. Pastor Phil, would you close us out this morning? Well, I am glad for the, the word of God this morning speaking to these issues um, that, you know, as, as I think about just in pastoral ministry and counseling and dealing with uh, this issue in particular, 
um, is one where there is just a ton of baggage. And I, I doubt that there's a person in this room that walks away from this not feeling some level of hurt or pain uh, because the more that we have pursued this kind of uh, culture of uh, expressive individualism, especially in this area of sex, um, it has left a wake of hurt and baggage and scars. And so I'm, I'm thankful for that song. Uh, my, my heart needs a surgeon. My soul needs a friend. That's, that's what we need from Jesus in this area. We need the healing that Jesus provides. You know, there are too many people that, that I've sat across with from that uh, have been marred by the, the hookup culture, uh, chewed up, spit out, and, and find themselves like this, the, that woman at the well. Far too many um, lives of those who are, are, are sons and daughters or family members of those, those who have experienced deep hurt from those who have, who have left to pursue that self-actualization through through their lives. So, um, what what we need is the hope of the gospel. I'm thankful for Chastine bringing that uh, to us this morning, um, and and I would encourage you. Like, we're going to be up here after the service, and if you just need somebody to to pray with you, we'll be here to pray with you. Uh, we'll be here to to hang out and spend time uh, here before we uh, run off anywhere. Uh, we want you to know that you are loved and uh, and your pastors care for you. Um, as well, if, if there are things that, that were said that, that, are, that you have questions about or things you want to kind of probe into a little bit more, we'd love to discuss that and, and have that conversation with you. So, so we'll be down front here just kind of hanging out after the service, so please make use of that. Um, as well, just a couple of announcements uh, for you. So uh, after the service, if you've been around or would like to um, you know, get to know the pastors a little bit more and understand a little bit more about the mission here at Christ Fellowship Eastside, you are invited to our Connections Lunch. Uh, this may be your first time with us or you may have been uh, several times with us. Uh, we'll have some food. I think um, it's uh, some Schlotzky's uh, today. So um, good, good uh, local Italian, right? Uh, something like that. <laughs> So, so please come join us. We'll have one of these back rooms that we'll, we'll hang out, eat a meal, answer some questions, explain a little bit more about the church. Um, and then as well, don't, don't forget, mark your calendars. Next, uh, is it uh, next week or two weeks uh, from now is the first week of... Next week uh, is the first Sunday of the month. Uh, we're going to have Donut Day, so uh, be sure to show up a little bit early, hang out. We'd love to have you as we start a new series, Kings and Kingdoms, uh, where we're going to go into uh, start with the book of 1 Samuel, and I love it. Uh, the very first story in Samuel um, is, is a mother's prayer for a child. Uh, deal, deals with deep themes of, uh, that, that actually reinforce some of the things that we're talking about, these, these challenges of parenting and prayer um, and, and all of these complex things. So that, that's where we're going to start there in, in the book of 1 Samuel. I hope you'll be able to join us and especially come early uh, to hang out with us. Um, as I, as I uh, send us on our way, I, I was struck again by that doxology from Jude, Jude 24 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. The gospel goes with you. Go in peace. <laughs>